What's more alarming is that 10 to 15 percent of such sudden deaths are young adults below the age of 40. They were all seemingly fit. So what could have been the cause? For a 33-year-old Ronnie, going out for a soccer match was part of his regular exercise program, a fun way to keep fit and be in touch with his colleagues. Though not an outstanding athlete, he had always been fit. At least up to that point, he had no known illnesses. It was yet another friendly match. Little did his friends realize that this was to be their last game together. Halfway through the match, Ronnie felt some discomfort. He thought nothing of it and kept it to himself. It was a while before his friends realized that something was amiss.
this particular case is a young man who had uh, what we will term sudden death because he suddenly collapsed and died almost instantaneously. The cause of death in his particular case was because there was blockages in the arteries of the heart. He is a little bit unusual because he's so young and yet he already has these blockages in the arteries. But um, we have some data from example in the Vietnam War where they show that even people as young as 18 years old, they already have some early blockages in the heart. At the end of the uh, soccer match he was involved in, he went into what we call ventricular fibrillation. And this is usually associated with a heart attack. When he goes into the ventricular fibrillation, which is, means a very chaotic, very abnormal electrical rhythm of the heart, we need to immediately shock them back into normal rhythm by using a defibrillator. In the setting of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, we need to administer that the latest within 10 minutes or less. When we look at the, the circumstances involved in this particular case, he apparently collapsed at about uh, 1817, um, which means that it was about 617 in the evening. But uh, by the time the ambulance reached him, and started to try to reactivate his heart back, there was a delay of almost about um, 20 minutes all in. So part of the delay, we note, was because when he immediately collapsed, there was no one who called the ambulance until almost 10 minutes later. So this delay is critical. The second delay was um, when the patient collapsed, there was no one who started the CPR immediately. So I think the, the important thing about this particular case is that when someone collapses, one must initially determine whether he is really collapsed, that means see whether he is breathing, whether he has a pulse. If there's no breathing and there's no pulse, then you should activate the ambulance immediately because this will save precious minutes. Then someone should then immediately do CPR. Besides applying CPR and calling for the ambulance, what else can the people around do? The other thing which the bystanders can do is to help the ambulance officers when they arrive at the scene. Sometimes when the ambulance officers arrive, they do not know exactly where the uh, collapsed patient is. So like in this particular case, they could have uh, directed the ambulance right to where the collapsed patient is and instead of waiting at the car park and waiting for someone to come and tell them. Someone should have been there to tell the ambulance exactly where the collapse so that they could then immediately go to as near the collapsed patient as possible. I think these are little things which the public can do but can save minutes, seconds uh, and this can help in someone whose time limit is about 10 minutes only. It was unfortunate that Ronnie wasn't resuscitated in time. His death was sudden, and his friends didn't realize how critical the situation was. If you see an ambulance while driving on the road, remember to give way to it, because by doing so, you can help save a life. It's important to keep a check on your physical fitness. As in this case, being young does not always mean everything's well. This is why there's always a warning about checking your fitness level before embarking on serious exercises. First, they should uh, go for a medical checkup if they have not done so, to make sure they are fit enough to start on some exercise program. Then they should progress slowly, gradually, building up their fitness level from uh, what they can comfortably do uh, to whatever uh, they want to reach, whatever fitness level they want. They should also prepare themselves, for example, by uh, appropriately dressing themselves, not like what I'm doing now, but in uh, proper t-shirt, shorts and uh, proper equipment like shoes. They should also uh, hydrate themselves, that means uh, drink enough water to prevent uh, heat stroke and other heat stress problems. And they should have proper warming up, prepare the body for more vigorous exercise. If you want to find out more about your own fitness level, you can do so through the National Physical Fitness Award Challenge, or NAPFA, organized by the Singapore Sports Council. This program is free of charge. A lot of us are becoming very sedentary. That means we hardly do anything physical. You know, uh, 
at home, you hardly do anything because either the maid is doing it or you have all this automated uh, equipment to help you, like washing machines and uh, even dishwashers. Uh, and then at the work, most people don't even use any energy doing work. They're sitting down in the office and maybe handling the computer or doing a lot of reading or writing and that doesn't use up much energy at all. Our bodies were made for exercise and if we do not use our bodies, then we start to develop all kinds of problems including lack of fitness and even medical conditions eh, like heart trouble, high blood pressure, diabetes and so on. So we are talking about 90 minutes a week. Everyone should have at least 90 minutes a week to spare for exercise. To find out more about NAPFA, you can call 1-800-348-4222 or visit the Singapore Sports Council's website on the internet. Next on Code Red, a young victim struggles against a fatal disease. Rare but very serious disease. When it hits children especially, it can be life-threatening and its long-term effects devastating. Lydia Ang was only three months old when she suddenly came down with meningitis. It was well past midnight. Christina Ang had just put to bed her baby who was ill. Her husband was awoken by noise coming from the cot. He sensed that something was wrong. At first, the father couldn't understand why the baby had stopped crying. Then he realized she had difficulty breathing. Lydia was rushed to the hospital. It was the beginning of a nightmare. Little Lydia Ang was born in 1993, on August the 6th, the same birthday as her father. She was their second child. But when she was just three months old, she suddenly fell ill. Until um, that moment when we sent her to the hospital, we we didn't even realize that she was in a serious state. Not until the doctor says that she is very, very ill. Lydia had the problem of hydrocephalus caused by meningitis. Hydrocephalus means water in the brain. And meningitis is an infection of the brain and its coverings. In her case, the hydrocephalus was a fairly complicated type of hydrocephalus. The brain is covered by linings that protect it. However, when a person contracts meningitis caused by bacteria, the linings become infected. Scarring of the brain tissue from the inflammation blocks the natural drainage of brain fluid, which is water that normally protects the brain. As a result, the brain fluid collects in holes or cavities, causing a dangerous buildup of pressure on the brain and the brainstem. And the only way to treat it is to divert that excessive brain fluid to another location. And this diversion is done by placing tubes to carry fluid out of the, out of the brain and under the skin into the, into the uh, stomach area, for example, where it can be reabsorbed naturally into the body. If the pressure is not relieved, the child slips into coma, becomes unresponsive, and then stops breathing. It was a trying time for Christina, who began to feel that Lydia's illness was her fault. I was really very, very guilty because oh, yeah. she was diagnosed of having hydrocephalus meningitis, uh, which means having water retention in the brain. I know it's my fault. I'm responsible for it. A lot of people actually questioned me. Were you drinking a lot of water when you were pregnant, when you were carrying her? So 